Today, I want to share a message that I believe is so essential to Christianity. And I pray that, that you will just bypass me, that your Holy Spirit will go to directly to each heart today and you will speak to that heart so that person will walk out of this place with the message that he or she needs and i pray that in jesus's name amen you know i uh i think we're doing it wrong i think we're doing it catastrophically wrong I think we're doing this thing called Christianity wrong. This thing called church. I fear we are actually disobeying, and yes, I'd use that word, disobeying the most pointed command of Jesus, which is why we are flailing in the deep end. Some, some have already drowned. We are barely staying afloat. Now, by we, I mean Christianity at large. And by Christianity, I mean, more specifically, the church. And because it's what I know best, I really mean the North American church, which includes the mighty mega congregations and the age-old chapels across the country, down to the tiny Rural churches across the plains. I fear we're doing it wrong. And it's not too late to fix it. As a matter of fact, now is a remarkable, remarkable time in history. When I believe the radical act of answering the call of Jesus, even by a small congregation somewhere in, I don't know, say, southeastern Nebraska, could change the world. Jesus is looking for real disciples. Right here, right now. And I have never been more optimistic about the future. At the end of Jesus' remarkable ministry, he stood with his closest followers on a hilltop in Galilee, now, only Jesus knew what was about to happen, but those with him, they must have wondered what was up. His most loyal friends, followers, students, imitators, lovers, and dare I say fanatics were absolutely convinced that this man, Jesus, was no mere teacher. He was God and is God himself, the word made flesh. They had witnessed it all and would in time tirelessly tell all. In Jesus' wake, the blind could see, the lame could walk, the dead were raised, and most miraculous of all, their own stone hearts had been transformed and made flesh. They witnessed the same man who fed thousands with little more than a kid's sack lunch later mocked by thousands, whipped beyond recognition, and nailed to a crossbeam of wood. They had suffered the dark night of real hell, wondering if at any moment the temple guards would burst through the doors and arrest them. And then they had witnessed the same Jesus alive again. The tomb opened and empty, and angels... I think teasing them almost. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's alive. So right there on that hilltop, Jesus turned to speak his last command to them. A call to worldwide revolution. He said, go, therefore. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. 
Then as he defied gravity itself, Jesus assured them, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And to this very day, he sits at the right hand of the Father, our Father, in the very throne room. So with those few words, Jesus laid out a singular purpose for the church. Our, our church. The singular purpose of every true follower of Jesus. Go and make disciples who will go and make disciples who will go and make disciples. In doing so, the kingdom of heaven would permeate a diseased, infected, contaminated world, rotting with the gangrene that we call sin. That's the plan. Plain and simple. It seems so obvious, right? <laughs> Yet clearly most who call themselves Christians, including me, have long convinced ourselves that we've got a better plan than Jesus. Instead, over time, we have tried other plans and other methods to save the world and reach the world. Like we've tried marching armies through rivers and calling it baptism, as Constantine did. We certainly haven't been afraid to call people to Christ at the tip of a spear. And we've burned a few at the stake because nothing says love your neighbor like barbecuing them. Not to mention we've sawed people in half, we've boiled people in oil, or even made them sit through terrifying evangelistic crusades with complicated charts and images of frightening beasts. And a very sexy woman on top of the beast. Today's horrified church, aware of, you know, maybe that wasn't the best way over the past two millennia, We've, we've been trying a kinder and softer gospel. Let's call it the gospel Americana. In which we entice people with a painless, easy commitment, an easy allegiance that asks little more of us than a weekly social hour. We dressed this kinder, softer gospel with hip songs and smoke machines, and lasers, and attractive preachers in skinny jeans. <laughs> Clearly, that's not our church. <laughs> and all to get seekers to pray what we call the sinner's prayer. It's a good prayer, by the way. And I am not here to criticize that prayer. It's a prayer many of us prayed in varying forms upon our, conver our conversion. I did, and I meant it. Many of you did. Here's an example of it. Dear Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my life and cleanse me of my unbelief. I believe in you and in salvation through the blood of Jesus. I turn from my sin and trust in Jesus alone as my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. That is a beautiful prayer. It contains all the elements of repentance, of conversion. And if you've not prayed this prayer, I pray you will. And yet, the sinner's prayer, in all its clever brevity, is utterly meaningless without the next step. It's called discipleship. No doubt discipleship may be the least sexy word in church. If you want to clear a room, announce one's intention to discuss discipleship. The only word I can think of that's maybe less sexy is obedience. <laughs> or stewardship. <laughs> or, no, I've got it. Submission. No. Yet even these words are actually just fundamentals of discipleship. Amen. Now a disciple 
is really just an old-fashioned word for a devoted student or follower. Now, a disciple is not merely interested in learning all he or she can from the teacher. A disciple actually aims to become like the teacher in nearly every way. In Jesus' day, it was commonplace for great teachers to have disciples. The best among those would often be elevated by the teacher as successors who then would make more disciples. And Jesus' astonishing call to revolution, what we call the Great Commission, Jesus clearly is choosing his successors on this earth. And we're it. All who will follow him, all who will obey his commands, all of them are his successors. The church, the body of Christ, the hearers of his message, we are the new disciples. And our purpose, to make more disciples at all costs, even to our lives. Now, this is not the kind of teaching that goes down easy for most and I woke up this morning very nervous most of you have heard me before know that I love I love to talk about the grace of Jesus and I believe in it passionately but more than once Jesus' own disciples called it quits when Jesus spoke of true discipleship they said this is a hard teaching who can accept it? Scripture tells us that many among his followers left. All this talk of eating flesh and drinking blood, taking up our crosses and following him. This is, this is a weighty teaching. And Jesus went so far as to say, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their crosses and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. So you got that? Follow me and die. Put that on a brochure. Put that on the church marquee and just watch the pews fill up. No wonder people left. The call to discipleship is the most extreme call Jesus ever gives. It is a call to a radical takeover of the world. A revolution that requires nothing more, nothing less than everything of the revolutionaries. For that's precisely what a disciple is. A thoroughly unquestioning, radically obedient follower of Christ. A disciple of Jesus is nothing less, nothing more than a sinner who by grace has received the tremendous honor of Jesus' call. Follow me. Get up. Follow me. When Jesus was walking on a beach, he saw Simon, who would later be called Peter. Peter. Simon was mindlessly minding his own business, fixing his nets. Then everything changed for him because Jesus walked up to him and said, follow me. Now in today's theology, a kind of bargain basement grace, if you will, it would be enough for Simon to just give Jesus a thumbs up. Maybe like his post on social media. Simon might have said, hey, I like what you're doing, Jesus. Keep up the good work. And then he could get back to his nets. He might have said, you know, hey, thanks for the grace of salvation. Thanks for, you know, the promise of heaven. But if it's all right with you, I'm going to stick with fishing. Simon might even offer to help fund Jesus' ministry. That is maybe for a tax write-off. After all, grace is amazing. It saved a wretch like him. 
It's a great song to sing while fishing. And that's enough, isn't it? That's enough. Such a response from Simon would be nothing more than a bargain basement grace. A discount grace sold at the local discount church. Such a grace would be a moment worthy of celebration today. But hardly the pearl of great price for which one would sell all he has to claim. Such a grace would not be the treasure in the field for which one might give everything to buy. Bargain basement grace. Or what Dietrich Bonhoeffer first called cheap grace. It's a grace that comes at the lowest cost to myself and I can get the lowest cost I can get by with. It's kind of a golden ticket grace that somehow assures me of heaven while allowing me to keep my feet on the ground. The grace of Jesus came that day to Simon in the form of a call. Follow me. Now note this. Nothing Simon had ever done before or ever would do merited that call. The God of the universe had approached him and said, follow me and I will give you a task far greater than catching fish. Upon making the call, Jesus expected something of Simon. And it is to the devil's great misery that Simon, whom Jesus named the rock, responded to the call for no apparent reason, but that Jesus had called he dropped his nets, left his boats, and followed Jesus. His brother Andrew did the same. His buddies James and John did the same. And Matthew, the tax collector, he got the same call. The text gives us no background, no reason for him to respond, except that it is Jesus who calls. And Matthew responded. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus tell them, Hey, good job, boys. You passed the test. Now you can go back to what you were doing. Now, what Jesus in his grace called them to was bigger than any one of them could have imagined. One wonders what their response would be if they could actually see the adventure they had given themselves to. But Jesus in his grace often tells us very little. He only asks that we follow, that we obey. Ooh, there's that word again. And that is his call to us this day and every day. He shows us true, amazing grace in asking, follow me. Have I got a life for you? I recognize my words seem archaic, like an old preacher, getting old. Maybe even to some it sounds legalistic. To the accusation that this message sounds archaic, I say emphatically, yes, absolutely. We used to call it the old time religion. We used to say it was good for the prophet Daniel. And Hebrews 11 tells us it was good enough for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rahab, and a whole host of witnesses. It is the call to faith in Christ. Even if we don't understand what on earth he's asking, the answer is yes. The call of Christ is not to self-interest. It's not to self-interest here on earth, nor is it a, is it a call to an occasional hobby. It's not an outfit to be worn one hour a week. It's not an occasional fan conference for which we can go and kind of put on our Christianness. Nor is it a good deed, a good deed club like, I don't know, Kiwanis or Rotary in which one might make a difference in some people's lives, make some really good friends, enjoy good food together. And ultimately, even networks with some like-minded friends. 
the call of Christ asks, dare I say, demands, commands, really, that we take up our cross and follow him. It asks us to die daily. It promises life abundantly, but it also actually promises us the animosity of the world. It asks everything of us. As for the accusation that my words sounded tad legalistic, I say no. I refuse to accept that. Or as Paul would say, by no means. By grace, Jesus calls us and there is nothing we have done to earn that call. Nor is there anything we can do thereafter to impress him. We are sinners. We are sinners saved by nothing but his grace. He alone is the worthiness we wear. But grace through faith is not a mere get into heaven free card. It is an anything for you, Lord, card. It is a free invitation to work side by side with Jesus in his mission to save the planet. Grace then will equip us with skills we never knew we had before. It will give us words we hardly believed we, that would come out of us. It will give us such undeserved joy, which I felt during the singing today, while the rest of the world seems terrified for the future. Grace is all that is needed to save a wretch like me. Not merely for heaven, though that's kind of a biggie, but for the exhilarating task of being at his side as a disciple to make more disciples who will make more disciples. Grace is not merely a ticket to heaven. It's an undeserved commission to work on behalf of God's government. And when you walk in the room, friends, no matter whether it's a coffee shop or a church or your workplace, when you walk in the room, it ain't just nobody who walked in. It is an emissary of the kingdom of heaven. That's grace. And it's amazing. One night, the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee. And no doubt they were tired. But they'd sailed that massive lake 10,000 times. But a storm kicked up, and it was a big one. Now, ex experienced as they were, they couldn't control the boat. Suddenly... They looked out on the waves and they saw a man walking on the water. Here's what scripture says. And on the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, wait, can I just comment on that real quick? So the fourth watch, that actually is about three to six in the morning which for some of you is just early in the morning. For college students, that's called, you know, middle of the afternoon. Either way, admit it, you'd be freaked out too. Well, it turns out the disciples were freaked out. And they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Interestingly, I learned this. It's a common, it was a common superstition in Jesus' day that demons actually walked among the storms. So far more terrifying than a ghost, what the disciples actually are afraid is that they see a real demon over there. But then immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Now, what Jesus is saying here, by the way, is remarkable. Now, we usually translate this passage grammatically. Take heart. It is I. Or take heart. Don't be scared. You know, it's, it's me. But what he actually is saying, if we translated it literally, is this. Take heart. I am. Jesus comforts them by declaring who he is. He might as well have said, hey, 
Do you guys, I know you're a little scared right now, but do you remember that burning bush thing? That was me. That was me. Take comfort. I am, therefore I am. And Peter answered, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to, come to you in the water. And Jesus said, come on, come. Now, too often, I think we see this as some sort of hubris on the part of Simon Peter. But Matthew, in his gospel, doesn't seem to see it that way. Instead, Peter recognizes the heart of the call. And he understands that only Jesus can call. We can't just go when Jesus hasn't called. To step out of the boat without Jesus' call would be a disaster. Perhaps even catastrophic. But Jesus says, come. This is grace, friends. But note, once the call is made, Peter has actually abandoned all alternatives. He must come. He must obey. And to change his mind now would be disobedience. He must come. And he does. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. That must have felt weird. We're so hard on Peter, I feel. Yet we find few better examples of true discipleship than right here. But when he, when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And Jesus, he immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him saying, Oh, you of little faith. I imagine we don't have, it's like, kind of like texting. You don't get the true feeling of it, but you get, you certainly do kind of hear Jesus saying, you, know, you little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly you are the son of God. By grace, Peter was called. By grace, he did the one thing he could do in response. He took the first step. Abandoning, abandoning any solid ground he thought he had, he took the first step. He literally walked on the water. Yeah, he got scared. Yeah, he sunk for a bit. And yes, by grace, Jesus was there with a saving hand of grace. We're watching Peter right here in this moment, learning from Jesus himself. It's a lesson that would help him become what Paul would later call the mighty Cephas, the mighty rock. Jesus is a disciple. And Jesus calls us, come, come, learn from me. Let me teach you. Let me train you. You will do even greater things than this. I've decided I'm not going to call new creation a little church anymore. I mean, we're small in number compared to a lot of churches, and our little building is little. But imagine with me for just a moment. Imagine with me. Imagine a congregation, not of pew warmers, not of lukewarm believers who make Jesus what a vomit. I'm not saying that's you, by the way. But imagine a congregation of disciples. Imagine just for a moment what Jesus could do with such a body of people. What he is actually doing. I believe personally, Jesus could transform not merely Lincoln, but the world. Starting right here. I marvel actually at the ragamuffin people we are. And God's not done adding to our band. I mean, think about this. Think about this just for a minute. God has brought together some among us who are pastors. I mean, has a church our side ever had five or six pastors in its congregation? That's not an accident. We have teachers here. We have teachers, those whom God has called to teach the deep riches of Scripture. The deep riches of, riches of life, 
maybe even a little math. He's also called healers here. I'm amazed at how many genuine experts we have in this congregation in the fields of health, natural medicines, healthy eating. I was thinking, Lord, are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> we need to become a congregation that is teaching people to live healthy. Amen. We have genuine experts here. You know what else we have? And I, I actually mean this. We have some people, I believe, with prophetic ability to discern the will of God. And that absolutely can't be an accident. We have individuals here who are gifted in hospitality. Creative hospitality, like I've never seen before. We have builders. We have artists. We have gardeners. We have creators. We have writers all in abundance. I mean... It's a freakish church here. <laughs> I've never seen such an abundance of creativity. And to have them all get along is a miracle. What God can, has in mind, I mean, I can only imagine. We have children. What a gift and honor to share this building with our children. And we have teachers of children. We have some who love to sing with children, even about pizza. <laughs> Speaking of which, we have musicians. Oh, my word. Can it be an accident that a church so small is rich in musicians in singers and players and songwriters? And God has called powerful, powerful prayer warriors filled with the spirit of God and unafraid to approach the throne. Can that be an accident? I don't think so. It is not an accident that we have such individuals here with us. Now imagine if we all, all of us, took Jesus' call seriously. He has extended such grace to us, the grace of his blood, the mercy of his forgiveness, the hope of his salvation. The assurance of his salvation. And he has called out, follow me. I have a task for you. For each of you. Follow me. Jesus is calling us right here. New creation to be a hub for his revolution. It's called the kingdom of heaven. He is calling new creation and all truly faithful churches to be a disciple making boot camp. God is building something here. I love that. I love that little motto that we have. It's on our shirts. And I've labored in prayer asking, God, what on earth are you building? And I think I finally have an answer. God is building disciples. And that's nothing small. Jesus said, amen. Jesus said to his disciples in his last moments with them there in the upper room, he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and put you in the world to bear fruit, fruit that won't spoil. I've got a plan for you. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the father in relation to me, he gives you. And then he's added this, but remember the root command because I want you to obey my commands and here's my biggie, love one another. Let's pray. Father God, you have called us. You brought us together this delightfully interesting, wonderful, diverse group of people for a purpose. You've brought us together you brought us together to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. You've got it. You brought us together to share what you shared on earth. Father, I pray that you will give us 
the courage. We've heard the call. Like Peter, we've heard you say, come. Like Peter, we've heard you say, follow me. Now, Lord, give us the courage and your grace to take the first step. To step on the water. To drop the nets and follow after you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.